what I'd call this. Um, a little time ago, I actually did a little leaflet that uh, was in the foyer of the hall for quite a time called Money Matters, and I'll quote a bit from that a little bit later on. I'm going to do it again in, in three parts. The first part, I'm going to try and see if we can extract what I'm, re I'm calling the financial economy of the Old Testament. What I mean by that is trying to understand how finance worked in the Old Testament um, and seeing if we can just establish some principles there. And then um, secondly, in the second session, we'll go on to, we'll re in a sense, we will go back to familiar ground of rights. Uh, my rights, your rights. How do I regard your rights? How do I regard my rights? And then in the end, we'll look at responsibilities. So we'll make a start with them. Um, this first part, which I'm calling the financial economy of the Old Testament. What I really mean by that is just simply the way in which it was expected to work. When God brought the people to himself at Sinai and made them his people and entered into a covenant with them, um, he gave them a kind of a financial system which would support the covenant that he brought them into. And it was really sort of quite comprehensive. And there's probably more about it in the Old Testament than you would uh, guess at. One of the things that we need to keep in mind is that the, the people of Israel, as a result of coming into this covenant with God, it was actually, in many ways, a very costly covenant. It cost you to be a member of the Sinaitic covenant community in all kinds of ways, not just in uh, the sacrifices for sins, when it speaks of these things in Hebrews, it actually makes a distinction. This is Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 1, <clears throat> where it speaks about a high priest, and it says this, For every high, chapter 5 and verse 1 of Hebrews, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both. So you've got two categories of offerings here that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. So the old covenant sacrificial system had kind of two aspects to it. One part was sacrifices for sin, and that pointed to uh, the need for redemption, the need for atonement, the need for God to deal with sin. <clears throat> but there was another aspect of it which actually spoke of the way in which people responded to God how they gave themselves to God. And this was portrayed in all kinds of offerings. <clears throat> These are sometimes referred to as voluntary or free will offerings. If you turn to Leviticus, this will be a place for us to start. Leviticus chapter 22 and verse 18. I just wanted to pick out a single word here really Leviticus 22 and verse 18 I'm going to say a little bit about Leviticus in a few minutes this is verse 18 speak to Aaron and to his sons and to all the children of Israel and say to them whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers in Israel who offers his sacrifice for any of his vows or for any of his free will offerings, which they offer to the Lord as a burnt offering. And then it goes on to give all kinds of details. But it's making a point here that many of the offerings of the people of Israel were voluntary offerings. They weren't obligatory. They weren't, uh, they weren't laid down and you had to do them. You did these things because you wanted to do them. They were expressions of your gratitude to God which is why in Hebrews it divides the whole sacrificial system into those two parts and speaks of sacrifices for sin and gifts. It's an amazing thing, if you think about it, that God should make it possible for men to give gifts to God. I don't know whether you've ever kind of thought about it, but God, of course, has need of nothing. He is the only, this is a theological term, he is the only self-sufficient being Every other object and every other being in the whole of creation is dependent upon other beings and ultimately upon God himself. But God is utterly independent. He needs nothing except himself. 
But God has chosen to make it possible for men and women to give to God. Give things to God that God has chosen to receive from them, not because he needs them in an absolute sense, but because he's determined to um, allow us this aspect of fellowship and to express our gratitude. There's an old saying that um, uh, the saddest side is to find a grateful atheist. You heard that phrase? One of the saddest sights is to find a grateful atheist. Someone who is grateful and doesn't know what to do with his gratitude. Um, it happens quite often, I think, with kind of men and they have their first child and they hold it in their arms and every instinct in them actually is to kind of rise up and give gratitude to a God they don't believe in. So it's a very kind of frustrating time. It's a wonderful thing that God has given us an opportunity to express our gratitude to him in different ways. Okay, so with these, many of these were opportunities for Israel to bring their grateful praise to God. Let's have a, look, a little look at tithing. And uh, if you turn to Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20. There are two, at least two, instances in uh, Genesis which deal with what you might call pre-Sinai tithing. Tithing was built into the Sinaitic covenant. But there are two examples at least of what looks like tithing earlier on. And the first one is in uh, the story of Abraham. And in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 20, um, Yes, chapter 14 and verse 20. This is the story of Abraham and Melchizedek. Melchizedek blesses Abraham and reveals truth to Abraham. And Abraham then um, makes this oath, which he, you don't hear until actually later. But this is his oath, verse 19. And he blessed him and said, uh, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And he, that's Abraham, gave him, that's Melchizedek, tithes of all. I don't know whether you've ever kind of thought of how strange this little event is. That God has just revealed to Abraham that God is the possessor of heaven and earth. And Abraham's immediate response is to give something to him. This is the God who already has everything. He is the possessor of heaven and earth. But this is a response in Abraham's heart to give through Melchizedek this gift back to God. And it actually says there he gave him a tenth or a tithe of all. And then there's another reference in Genesis 28 and verse 22. Genesis 28 and verse 22. And this is the story of Jacob running away from Esau uh, when he sleeps. And then he has this vision of God at the, at the head of this stairway or ladder, whatever your version calls it. And again, there's a revelation of God. And then there's, a, there's um, Jacob's response here, which you get in um, verse 22. I'll read from verse 20 so you can see how it comes in. But then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. I sometimes say, kind of tongue-in-cheek, that this is um, an amazing statement here, that God makes these categoric statements, unconditional statements that he makes to Jacob. And Jacob's reaction is to kind of get it onto some sort of formal basis. And his reaction is, well, if you keep your promise to me, and you do bless me, and you do prosper me, I will make sure you get a 10% commission on everything you give to me. 
Um, I'm sure there's an aspect of gratitude in there as well. I want to make a point about these two things because some people say, well, if you're thinking about giving, you need to think about tithing, they say, because tithing predates Sinai. They say, well, tithing is older than Sinai, so we ought to go back to tithing. Now, there's, there's two things we ought to kind of observe here about these two incidents, Abraham and Jacob. That in each instance, these were voluntary offerings. In neither instance did God ask for anything. And he certainly didn't command anything. These are the personal decisions and choices of these two men. And the other thing is that it does seem as though these are kind of these are kind of one-off payments. Um, it, it's, it's not that he's, they're talking about a regular uh, supply of something. It's, it's almost the sense that whatever you give to me, I will give this portion sort of back to you. And Abraham, of course, uh, wasn't making any deals at all. He was giving a tenth to God of all that he had. So this is a voluntary reaction of these people to God, and it certainly isn't a law. So although we are talking about a tenth, and what I'm saying is we need to be cautious about identifying these two events as tithing in the way that we normally think of tithing. Tithing was a religious obligation. It was a command. And we'll look at it in a moment. But these two examples of people giving a tenth to God aren't actually like that. They're not obligatory. They're voluntary. Okay, so let's have a look at um, Sinai. If you turn with me to Leviticus chapter 27. Leviticus, in a way, is a kind of a misnamed book. Um, I'm just looking at something and I don't think that I've got the right reference there. I might have. Oh, yes, I have. Um, it, it's, a, it's a misnamed book in as much as Leviticus, of course, automatically connects it in your mind with the Levites, that's to say the descendants of Aaron, and then, uh, sorry, the descendants of, of Levi. And then within the Levites, there was a, a subset, a smaller family, which was Aaron and his family. And it was from Aaron and his family that the priesthood came. But from the larger group of the Levites, you, you had a group of people whose job was, well, we'll see what their job was in a minute. But most of what you have in the book of Leviticus is actually not about the Levites. It's actually about the priests. It ought to be called priestical or something like that. I don't know what you're going to call it. Um, it isn't really about the Levites. It's actually really about the priests. Um, but there is this aspect of the way in which the economies function, which you'll see here. In Leviticus chapter 27 and verse um, 30, it says this. Last verse, last verses of this particular passage. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it. And concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock, of whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. So it, this, is, this is part of um, the, the Sinai covenant. So this is God laying down this law for his people that all of the people would be required to give a tithe. And they would give a tithe of their crops and of their fruits and of their animals. And it's interesting the way they had to give a tithe of their animals. They would um, drive them, as it says here, under a rod. And as it went under a rod, every tenth animal was picked out. That was, that's originally, of course, what the word decimate mean, meant. Nowadays, when people say decimate, they really mean um, leave very little. But originally, to decimate, it was kind of a Roman punishment that they had for that army. 
that if they wanted to punish the army, they would actually take every tenth man and punish him. And sometimes it was punishment of death. So that was what decimate meant. But what you've got here is you've got a very kind of even and equal way of doing this. So you don't ask any questions whether it's good or bad. You simply say 10, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That one's God's. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That one's God's. 21, 20, and etc. like this. This is the way all this part worked. So if you think about it, this is um, this is a, a kind of a considerable amount of money. Livestock have always been very costly, always very important to people. So this is a considerable contribution that the people of Israel are making year by year. But I want to kind of show you how this actually kind of develops. Um, I was saying that it has to. This this is all in the book of Leviticus. And in a sense, this all has to do with the priesthood. It all has to do with the way the priesthood functions. The people of Israel gave lots of gifts to God. There were some things that they were required to give. There were some things that they gave voluntarily. And then, on top of all that, there was this tithe, which was not voluntary, but was obligatory. They had to give this tenth. This is one of the things that kept them part of the covenant community. It was not a free will offering, it was an obligation. It wasn't actually designed, the whole system wasn't designed in one sense for the Levites. We'll see how this works out if you turn to Numbers chapter 18. If you turn to Numbers chapter 18, actually this whole economic system um, is designed to support the priests, as you'll see in a minute. Which is really quite amazing, because if you think about this, to begin with, when the first, when the first priest came in, do you remember how many priests there were? There were just five of them. There was Aaron and his four sons. Um, this is Numbers chapter 18 and verse 21. So it tells you what's going to happen to all the tithes that come from Israel, this is what's going to happen to them. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel. Okay, so all the tithes that came in from all the individuals of all the other tribes, all those, all those tithes were given to the Levites to help them. Well, you'll see what they do in a minute. Um, verse 21, I have given the children of Israel all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance, there's, we're going to see an important point here that we want to touch on a little bit later on, in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. In other words, the Levites, and it was their job to dismantle the tabernacle and to carry it and to do all the fetching and carrying and all the maintenance work, that was all their responsibility. In order to make it possible for them to do this, because the Levites were to have no inheritance, when they went into the promised land, the Levites didn't have any land given to them by allotment. Their inheritance, said God, is me. I am your inheritance. So this is the way the economic kind of pattern worked. Everybody gave a tenth of their income, essentially, um, to the Levites. Now, what do the Levites do with it? Okay, well, we'll... Read on a little bit. Hereafter the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. For the tithes of the children of Israel which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore I have said to them among the children of Israel, they have no inheritance. Okay, are you following this so far? So Israel, they all make their 10% contribution and it all goes to the Levites. Now what happens to the tithes with the Levites? Look what happens in verse 25. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Speak thus to the Levites and say to them, when you take from the children of Israel the tithes which I have given from them as your inheritance, 
then you shall offer up a heave offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. And your heave offering shall be reckoned to you as though it were the grain of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. And essentially what happens here is that this, um, a tenth of everything that the Levites give is actually kind of given back to God. But it's given back to God in what they call a heave offering. If you're reading an old King James Version, it will call it a wave offering. These were offerings which were symbolically brought to God and lifted up to God, waved to God, and then the priests had a portion, just a small portion was actually offered in sacrifice, but then it was the priests themselves who had this. So in fact you've got a tenth of the income of Israel comes into the Levites to support them in their work of all the work they had to do in support of the temple worship, but then a tenth of the Levites' income actually goes essentially to support the priests. It's a, it's a fascinating system, the way all this works together. Um, okay, and in fact it says in Numbers 18 and verse 29, um, of all your gifts you shall offer of every heave offering due to the Lord from all the best of them, I think the AV says the fat of them, the consecrated part of them. So the best was given so that the, 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 the priests would have it. And there's an important principle here in chapter 18 and verse 21 that we've just uh, looked at. Um, sorry, verse 31. Verse 31. You may eat it in any place, you and your households, for it is your reward for your work in the tabernacle of meeting. And you've got this, again, this connection that this is, this is payment. This is, this is wages. This is effectively wages for the priests. Because the priests are spending their time not looking after their fields, because they haven't got any, not looking after their flocks, but they are spending their time serving God and serving the people. And because of that, they have to be provided for in this amazing way. And it was, of course, absolutely essential because the old covenant can only work if you've got a functioning priesthood. Really, is, it's very easy for us to forget this. But the old covenant came into being and then immediately a priesthood was instituted as well. Because otherwise, the first single sin would have brought the whole covenant just crashing down. It would have been all over. But God provided this priesthood and then he provided for the priesthood so they would always have priests to minister. To keep. They, were, they really maintained the covenant. They, they kept it going. They kind of oiled and kind of cleaned it and made sure it was, it was right in all sorts of ways. Okay. Um, so you can see there that they are making that, um, that, that, uh, that contribution to uh, the priests. And in fact, there were lots of other kind of... Um, contributions that went to the priests there were portions of most of the offerings that went to the priests most of the sin offering went to the priest most of the trespass offering went to the priest most of the peace offering went to the priest the only offering that didn't go to the priest was the whole burnt offering and the reason they call it a whole burnt offering is because the priest didn't get any of it the whole of it was burnt in fact in Greek that's the word holocaust that's where the word comes from it means everything in one flame, all kind of given to God. Okay, what's this got to do with the New Testament? Well, these ideas, the truth of these ideas, the facts of these things, are in the mind of most of the New Testament writers. And you'll see this kind of reference. I'll show you one or two little references now. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 13. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 9 in a little bit more detail next. But verse 13, Paul writes this. He, he says, Do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar. 
Now, what he's just referring to is what I've just been explaining to you, uh, that the priests receive contributions from the offerings that were made to God, and part of it kind of came back to the priests. So this is kind of built in to Paul's understanding that he's going to talk about here, that those who are serving God will actually be sustained, supported, in some way as a result of those who are giving their offerings to God. And we'll see how that kind of works out in a minute. Um, and then in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 18, it says this. He says, Observe Israel according to the flesh. Something was chapter 13. And are not sacrificed. There's there's those who part of the sign in Hebrews 13 and verse 10, you've got this little phrase. Hebrews 10 and verse, sorry, verse 13 and verse 10. He says, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. The point he's making is that those who served in the tabernacle did have a right to eat some of the sacrifices that went to the altar. But he's saying now we, as members of the New Covenant, we have an altar that those Old Testament priests have actually no right um, to share in. It's just a, it's just a way, his way of saying that our blessings, our benefits are far greater than theirs. And they do not qualify for New Covenant blessings just because they were priests in the Old Covenant. That's what he's saying. Okay, I'm going to uh, take a little pause. So we'll pause.